Hi, my name is Tony McLaughlin, and I'm talking to Steve McLaughlin from FT Partners. Hi, Steve, thanks for joining us today. Tony, it's good to be here with another McLaughlin. Exactly. I'm <laughs> sure we're distantly related somehow. Absolutely. Hey, Steve, um, you've got quite a bit of fame in the fintech space as um, you know one of the most influential, if you like, deal makers. Um, it would be good to hear a little bit about your background and what kind of transactions you've been involved in. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on this today. It's uh, it's a privilege. So. Uh, yeah, the background is like I started the firm in 2002. Uh, before that, I was at Goldman Sachs. I was in the financial institutions group working with a lot of the big banks and insurance companies. Uh, but I very quickly uh, moved into fintech at Goldman during the dot-com boom. And then in 2002, I decided to leave and start this firm, Financial Technology Partners. And what we are is we're a boutique investment bank focused on the fintech space. So we cover all areas of fintech all around the world. We're 175 people. Uh, built in San Francisco originally, then moved to New York, uh, built an office in London, and we've got clients on six continents right now. So ranging from series A, B, all the way up to uh, multi-billion dollar companies. Um, you know, in terms of the, the, the background, so really the fintech space was, was, you know, really kind of in a funk, I think, at the end of, you know, 2001, early 2002. Yeah. But I saw a ton of clients calling me uh, at Goldman wanting a real attention, but the, the firm mm -hmm. had kind of pivoted away from it and pivoted back to sort of big FIs and away from sort of the early stage tech companies. And you see the big banks do that from time to time. Yes. But um, I loved working with the entrepreneurs, loved FinTech space. And, you know, so there's a huge opportunity here for all these, you know, private companies that are underserved and broke away and started the company. And so it's been 18 years. Uh, I guess it's yeah. an overnight success, but 24-7 uh, <laughs> for 18 years, you got to do something right. Of course, and uh, I, I guess, you know, 2002, I, I don't even know if fintech was a term uh, back in 2002, but you've certainly been in it um, from the very start. Um, but, but what I'd like to ask you is just like as you reflect back on, um, you know, the rise of fintech, I mean, what generally what is the fintech investment thesis? I mean, is it, is it basically a kind of like big short on, you know, banks who have been enjoying excess profits and have become bloated, their cost structures are out of control and they, they're not nimble enough. So is it basically a, a, a poor reflection on the state of banks that FinTech has risen so greatly? I don't think it's so much a poor reflection on the state of banks as much as it is just where the world is going, right? You know, people want, um, you know, and there's this, you have to break it in, there's a the consumer side of FinTech and then there's sort of the back office side of FinTech kind of enabling the banks, right, to, to compete. Um, and if you think about it, you know, the banks have had great, you know, fintech for a long time. I mean, online banking uh, was a thing in the, in the late 90s and, and sure. they've, they've, you know, done a great job with it. And even, you know, City, B of A, the big banks have great online banking services. Um, that being said, I think they haven't probably moved fast enough and consumers mm -hmm. are looking for something new, something different. And the, the idea that you can be a conglomerate and have insurance and banking and everything you know, all sort of tied together, sort of never really came together as perfectly as, as we would have all would have liked to do it at, at the big banks. But you see yes. today, you know, great companies like Revolut, uh, you know, creating the super app that one app can serve, you know, a, a whole bunch of different functions for a bunch of different types of populations across mm -hmm. multiple geographies, um, you know, doing incredibly well. Or a company like Chime that has a really a more simpler product in one geography uh, but it solves a lot of needs for a certain segment of the population. So, you know, you're seeing some, some apps and some, and some companies really focus on certain segments of the population and giving them exactly what they want for this point in time. And now with coronavirus, you know, people aren't really that excited to go stand in a line at a bank branch or go pay yeah. a bill on, uh, or receive mail that's touched by the mailman or, or woman. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the move to digital is, is kind of accelerating everything too. So it's, uh, yeah. it's not so much the banks have done a terrible job. I mean, I think a lot of people are really quite fine with their online banking and online brokerage experiences from, you yeah. know, city and the big banks or even an E-Trade, but there's a the segment of the population that wants something that's that much different and that much sexy and yeah. um, provides a lot more functionality is, is the cutting edge, but we're still sort of in, in the second inning of this. Yeah, I, I mean, that's one of, the, one of the questions I've got is around, you know, of, often the fintech is, per, 
phenomenon is, is portrayed as being, you know, the barbarians at the gate. It's uh, kind of like them and us type of uh, situation. But very often I see that the barbarians are actually inside the gate having coffee with the bankers. Um, yeah. There's one kind of description I've heard of fintech actually being a kind of layer on top of the banking system because many times the fintechs don't want to actually run balance sheets and they, they only want to be a technology layer. So uh, are, are these two spaces, you know, complementary and also, uh, you know, reflecting back on what happened when ride sharing opened up in California, it really grew the whole market. Is, is fintech growing the market for themselves and also for traditional banks? I don't think they're necessarily growing the market. I think there's definitely share being taken and there's a view that they may be the layer on top of the banks, but uh, they may be taking the most expensive layer, uh, yeah. you know, the most profitable layer from the banks, but yeah. also compressing um, another piece, of, which is the fee. So if they're taking all the interchange on the one hand, which is quite lucrative, but also um, doing it on a no fee basis. So that, that can really sort of take revenue and, and I think you know, kind of maybe collapse revenue uh, yeah. at the same time. So that, that's where I think it's somewhat threatening. And, and I think at this point in time, I don't think, you know, JP Morgan or City or B of A is like, you know, quaking in their boots over Revolut or Chime or any of these guys mm -hmm. like taking over their business because there's a quite large economy here. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the things that's been a little depressing to me over the course of time is a lot of these fintech companies get to be worth a billion or two, then they sell, right? They'll yeah. sell to a big bank or they'll sell to a PayPal. And so they don't really ever amount to, you know, that much. I think the thing you're seeing today though, is because the big banks aren't able to buy these companies and they've avoided going public for a long time because there's so much private money available that some of the businesses have gotten very big, very quickly. And so Chime at five, 10 billion money line companies like that at a billion plus, are, are starting to say, hey, we can maybe make a run at this. Um, yeah. And if you look back in the day, PayPal kind of kind of gave up. I mean, they, they went public and then they sold for a billion two or something like that to PayPal. Now look at it, it's worth, you know, $150 billion plus or yeah. minus. So I think I, I try to encourage a lot of these entrepreneurs to stick it out and, and keep fighting the big banks and keep, you know, kind of pushing and kind of creating more applications and going deeper into the population and, and just stick it out. And I think there's a huge market, but we haven't seen too many people with that big, big, uh, you know, outcome yet, like uh, the Spotify yeah. of banking uh, or the, you know, the Shopify of, of banking, although now you're seeing Shopify get into, into banking as well. So that's, that's but, another story. In other words, it's, uh, are you saying that it's difficult for an entrepreneur, entrepreneur to maintain motivation to take over the world when they've uh, reached unicorn status for their company? Yeah. I mean, you're seeing a few do it, but you don't really look at the uh, public markets and see, you know, any, you know, $5 billion and above, you know, digital bank or, or anything like that. So they have those valuations in the private market. Um, and you, you have seen some companies outside of digital banking, like just the other day, Lemonade went public and now enjoys a $3 billion market cap, you know, but even a, a company we sold in the insurance tech space called Assurance IQs, you know, they were killing it, doing great. It only been around for two and a half years, but they, you know, we, we ended up selling it to Prudential for three and a half billion dollars after two and a half, three years, you know, hard to say no to that. You know, I just talked yep. to an entrepreneur literally last night who has built a business over two and a half years and got an offer from one of the fintechs at, for four or $500 million. And he's going to make personally, you know, $150 million. It's sort of pretty tempting. So, yeah. so none of these things have really been able to reach the sky high, um, you know, kind of number. So, it, so therefore yeah. it hasn't really threatened the banks on any, any individual entity, but it's sort of death by a thousand cuts uh, at the same time as well. Yeah. Hey, Steve, I'm, one of the things I'm fascinated by because I'm not an investment banker is um, just how, how does a deal get done? I mean, what does, uh, what does a deal look like for you? I mean, how does the, the matchmaking take place um, and what kind of stages do you go through to actually get a deal done? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, I, how much time do we have here? We could be here all day. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's a few types. So a lot of times we'll get engaged with a company long before they decide they want to sell or, or even have an offer and they want someone by their side for the entire journey. So yeah. we have a lot of clients that we get close to and we work for a very long time. So for example, um, you have a company like Avid Exchange where you know, we got involved with them in 2009 and we've worked with them for all their transactions the entire time, including many attempts for people to, to buy the company, yes. with which we you know, advise them not to do so and to keep growing the company. And so now they're a multi-billion dollar company 
um, you know, you know, probably going to go public in a year or two. So same thing with Marquetta. You know, we met them when they had one million of revenue. They weren't really sure what to do. We ended up raising some capital for them. And now they've raised hundreds of millions of capital, just raised more capital for them at a four or five billion dollar valuation. And they keep growing. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, you know, we get a call from a company once in a while, actually quite frequently, where they've just gotten a call from someone who wants to buy them. Right. Yes. And it's that exact moment that they need to be, you know, picking up the phone, calling us and not, you know, sort of, you know, making moves. They're going to either, you know, get them too deep and in a hole they can't get out of from a negotiating perspective or present information in a way that, you know, might turn off that buyer or may not showcase it the right way. The, the one thing I think we've been trying to help most of these fin com fintech companies do is, is, is really kind of dream the dream in terms of what they're building. You know, what's the five, 10, 15 year, even 20 year vision for the company. So we're helping people build product maps, um, you know, geographic expansion, um, multiple layers of products onto multiple layers of products out into the future. You know, and, unless you have a 10 or 20 year vision, you can't really kind of get there. I mean, if you were square yeah. and you were telling a five year vision, you would have been telling a vision about dongles on yeah. iPhones, right? You wouldn't have been talking about going into real SMBs, going into the cash app, going into lending, going into point of sale financing and things like, like that. So, so um, you know, you really have to kind of tell the big vision and that's not something you can do, you know, in a weekend, right? And it's mm -hmm. not something an entrepreneur is usually sitting around doing uh, because they're looking to raise capital right now for the next couple of years. But when some strategic is looking at buying you, you want to find the strategic that really buys into the big vision yes. um, and is willing to, you know, kind of, kind of work with you around structuring a deal that will not only reward you for what you've achieved today, but what you can achieve in the future. And one of the trends that we're seeing is for buyers to really realize that these entrepreneurs they, they want to stick with their businesses long term, yeah. but if you just you know fully cash them out and you don't incentivize them going forward, it makes it hard for both parties to see mm -hmm. that vision getting achieved. So we're seeing deals where, you know, right now, you know, you may do a deal for a billion dollars, but there could be 150 million or 10 or 15, 20 percent on top of that price for the management team to incentivize them to keep with the company, keep going forward and stick it out underneath the big umbrella. Yeah, I mean, there's two types of buyers at the moment. There's other kind of like PE companies, and there's like trade trade buyers. Uh, do you do you have a preference in terms of where they end up? Do I have a preference where they wind up? I mean, my yeah. preference is is generally for them to, like I said earlier, to to keep private and you know keep raising money and go public and build something great. That being yeah. said, there does become a point in time where it makes sense for M and A to happen. I think sometimes people will will wait too long for that to happen. And then there could be a downturn in the economy and maybe the yeah. IPO market freezes up on them or something happens like coronavirus and it's put yeah. a, lot of, a lot of companies in a, in a bit of harm. Um, but, um, you know, I, th I think you, you do want to be looking out there and saying, you know, who's my acquirer going to be? What am I building something that someone's going to want? And you see a lot of people that are building something and they think that a bank will buy it or they think that you know, yeah. Google or Facebook or Amazon will buy it. And I think the M&A market for a lot of these companies has been um, fairly tricky, quite frankly. And that's why you've had to see some companies go public and some companies yeah. stay private quite long. So, okay, um, so you, you know, what's interesting to me as you look around the world is that, um, you know, I, I see a very clear trend that financial services will get embedded into platforms. I mean, you see that in China, you know, Alibaba and Alipay, um, sure. you know, or, you know, Tencent and uh, where well, WeChat and WeChat Pay, Grab and, uh, you know, Grab Pay. So as, as financial services get incorporated into platforms, the question is who's going to provide those financial services? Um, the, chi the China answer is the big techs themselves will provide the financial services. But it still seems to me that the West Coast players, the US West Coast players, they still kind of think of financial services being an adjacency to their core business. Um, so do, do you think that's going to be one of the differences? Do you see financial services being incorporated more into the big West Coast platforms? And if so, will the platform self-manufacture? Will they partner or buy fintechs? Or do banks have a shot at providing those, those financial services? Sure. You're really talking about um, embedded financial services, right? So financial services kind of being everywhere. If you're in WeChat, you're in Messenger, yeah. you know, you're, um, you know, playing a video game and you want to make a payment, right? That, that's all, yeah. a lot of that's already happening, quite frankly. But 
Um, and, and it's sort of the quote unquote open banking movement. You know, you saw Plaid, you know, just get bought by Visa. We just sold yes. a company called Finicity to MasterCard. Um, and there's all sorts of companies popping up all over the place that are helping do this kind of stuff like Finicity, uh, which I just mentioned is, is like partnering with all the banks and sort of Plaid was partnering with all the FinTechs. Yes. Um, there's a company called Phoenix uh, uh, that's actually, you know, helping out on, on the Payfac model. A uh, company called Bond, which is an open banking platform, allowing people to use APIs to embed payments, lending, even insurance um, and financial data, you know, in their applications. And Marketo would be an incredible uh, example of that. You know, they power DoorDash, Instacart, Square Cash. Um, yes. So, you know, things that you know, people are using their daily lives, they don't associate with fintech at all. But, you know, when that driver you know, goes to that restaurant to pick up your food, he's swiping a DoorDash card that's powered, you know, by Marketa uh, that enables that payment to happen, you know, to avoid fraud, to and make it frictionless and fast and convenient. Um, yeah. And it really is the underpinning thing powering you know, some of these business models, which you don't even think about on a daily basis. So, um, and that's why, uh, you know, Marketa is so valuable. Hey, Steve, my final question to you is that, um, you know, looking forward, I mean, I guess during this crisis, uh, you know, some fintech valuations have taken a little bit of a hit. Some, some business models like fintech serving the travel segment, for example, have been really decimated, but I'm sure you remain, uh, you know, very bullish about the space. And um, I'd like to hear about some of your thoughts in terms of what the post-COVID world might mean for fintech. Yeah. I mean, you've definitely seen some companies in some verticals get hit, you know, anything in travel for sure. Um, anything in SMB became a little bit difficult. Um, but I think what you've seen is um, in the broad stock market and in some of these specific examples is people are you know, saying, look, if you look again back to my 20 year vision, right? In any 20 year look at the stock market, you're going to see blips, but your stock market's gone up any, any 20 year period of time in history, it's gone up. So the good news is a lot of these companies raised a lot of capital during, you know, the good times, right? Yes. And so we are, are and, 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 and able to you know, withstand a temporary blip here. You know, companies like Toast who raised a lot of money, I'm sure had a blip, but then we're able to raise a lot more money, you know, during the crisis and we'll just keep going. PayPal stock took a huge hit. Now it's double what it was even um, uh, at the bottom of the crisis. So. You know, I think that the space is resilient. The move to digital is is becoming more and more obvious. And so, um, you know, there have been some companies that you know have had more serious issues, quite frankly. Um, but that's a minority of the companies. And quite frankly, you know, people don't think about it all the time. But even without coronavirus, there have been plenty of companies that have that have not succeeded. And sure. so that's the nature of venture capital. There's going to be gains and there's going to be losses. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so there we have it. And, and any any kind of like personal reflections in terms of um, how lockdown has implement has affected your um, you know life and and if we get back to normal then are the things that you've learned in lockdown that you'll carry with you? you know, I've I found that um, having really really strong relationships with clients um, and having a brand has really mattered because people have felt comfortable just picking up the phone and. And, and calling us up and saying, what should I do in this moment in time? You know, there's no time to call six banks and run a bank off and you want to call someone you've built a relationship with. So the relationship building over 18 years has been, yeah. you know, incredible. Um, I think personal reflection, I think, I think we all have to think about our families and our friends, you know, friends that are in need, you know, think about your, your mother or your your brother who may not be in as great a position as you are and maybe sitting in their apartment alone and may need a phone call and you may be trying to get a deal done or dealing with an investment committee or something like that, but you have to find time, you know, for those people. And, and that's really, really important. And you really can't do enough of that in this market. Um, you know, with, with the world the way it is, there's a lot of fear um, and anxiety and, and uh, lonely people that, you know, are in your life that you've got to spend the time with. And I, yeah. I have some personal experiences that, yeah, would lead me to believe that um, spending more time with those kind of people uh, is important right now. Yeah, I fully agree with you, Steve. And, you know, Steve, you talked previously about building uh, great companies and having the perseverance in the long run. And that's certainly what you've done. Uh, so congratulations for that. And, you know, investment banking is a people's business and you don't, 
uh, get to your kind of position without having a huge amount of integrity and a great reputation, which you certainly um, have in the market. Thank you. So it's been a it's been a delight to talk to you, Steve. Um, not only because you're a fellow McLaughlin, but thank you very much <laughs> for spending time with me today. Tony, thank you very much, and uh, stay safe over there in the UK. We'll speak to you soon on the next thank one. Thank you, sir. All right, thanks. Bye.